Thank you. As you find your seats, uh, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. We're in a, a short series to the book of Luke. Uh, this is our 63rd uh, uh, dying. Um, so, if, yeah, we, we, we'll, we'll continue. We'll be, we'll be done soon. Don't worry. Uh, Luke 16, verse 1 to 13. Now, uh, as you're turning there, one of the problems about preaching through an entire book is uh, you kind of get confronted by the topics that you don't naturally want to speak about. And, uh, yeah, you get into these things and you don't want to preach them. And so you have to. That's the joy about preaching through a book of the Bible. I can't just preach to you what I want to preach to you about. And so tonight we're going to be talking about something that I don't think any preacher is comfortable preaching about, which is money. Well, okay, there are some, but... We won't go there. That's a topic for another night. Um, we're going to be talking about money tonight. And as touchy as that topic is, we're going to be speaking from it in one of arguably the hardest passage in all of the Gospels. So that's what we got in store tonight. So let's dive in. I mean, if you've got your Bibles, we're in Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. I'll be reading from the New International Version uh, yeah, so Luke 16, verse 1 to 13. Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called them in and asked, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do? My master is taking away my job. I am not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. So that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called each of the, the masters debtors and he asked them first, How much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. He then asked the second one, How much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. And he told him, Take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest management because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, and am well. May the Lord bless the reading of his word tonight. Now, if you were focusing during the reading of that passage, you would have noticed a couple of difficulties that we're going to try and address and not avoid. One of them is that we have to reckon with the fact that the master, whoever the master is in this illustration of Jesus, praises or, or commends who? The dishonest manager. He praises them. I mean, that alone is a quagmire that we mostly ignore, right? We're just like, okay, we're not going to deal with that. Let's jump to the, to the application. Because that is... That is not, not enough. How do we work with that? The problem then is Jesus uses him as an example to us. Do you notice that? In fact, Jesus says you must be like, and I emphasize, the dishonest manager. Yay. <laughs> and again, we're talking about money here. Notice my uh, <laughs> enthusiasm in bringing this to you. But in fact, we're going to dive into it. We're going to dive in head first. We're going to not check how deep this water is. We're just going to swim tonight. And hopefully you'll swim with me. So let's ask the question, what is Jesus trying to teach us? What does the Spirit of God want us to hear in this passage as Luke records it in his gospel? Well, that's what we're going to be unpacking. And the first thing we have to reckon with, the first thing we have to understand is, well, the problem of this text, which is our first point. The problem of the text. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. When you read a text like this, especially, I don't know if you guys, quiet times, you get to a passage like this, and you're like, don't understand that. Thank you, Jesus. Let's move to the next one, right? But it's here for a reason. And, and the problem is, when we read a text like this, one of the greatest dangers is we import our own modern sensibilities and ways of understanding the world into the text 
and expect it to make sense. We can have problems with the text simply because we have no idea what's being communicated because we are looking at it through 21st century eyes. And, and I think this text is brilliant at exposing that for us. I mean, look at the story. We look at this and we like, this manager is a thief. It's clear and honest, right? He's stealing his master's money. And when he gets caught for it, he crooks the books to steal even more money for himself, right? The problem is, is that what it's saying? Well, I don't know. In that, in that culture, if you stole from a master, the master had every right not to fire you, but to execute you. In Roman culture, if you mismanaged the master's money, it wasn't you're fired. It was, you know, this is Sparta, you know, that, that image. So that doesn't line up. So what's happening? Well, the text says he was wasting his master's possessions. In other words, put simply, he was a bad manager. It's like if you've got a finance guy, a finan financial manager, and you go to him next year, at the end of your year, and you're trying to recount your, your investments, and he's like, there are none. That's a bad financial manager. That's kind of what's going on here. You know, you're like, no, no, you, that was your job. You, you're doing a bad job. I should have investments. That's exactly what's going on here. And in fact, the problem is, you might ask, well, then surely it was wrong of him to write off the debts. And I would want to say yes, except in the mountain of articles that I read this week, there is absolutely zero consensus. No one knows what's going on in this text in terms of scholarly works. So go to the scholars and they will disappoint you. In fact, one of the, the, the articles I read this week, it, it, it was quite amusing. It said, the parable of the dishonest manager is generally considered as the most difficult to interpret. As far back as the 16th century, Cagenitus declared that this was impossible to expound. So good luck to us. Now, I have to show you this because I'm not going to say like I'm better than all the scholars in the world. We're going to expound this tonight. We're just going to take this text seriously. We're just going to look at it. Because there's a big danger in this text that we like, we can't understand the first part, so we're just going to dismiss it. I listened to a bunch of sermons this week in preparation. And guess what? All of them go to the second part of the text. It's like, we don't know what's going on here. Let's talk about the second part. And literally most sermons. Like, having a clue, let's talk about being good managers. And then we'll get to that at the end of the sermon. But bear with me. Church, we cannot simply dismiss the first half of this text for the sake of the lesson at the end. Many people do. But Jesus uses this as an illustration and then says quite pertinently be kind of like this guy and if we're like saying we're just going to ignore that we're ignoring what Jesus is trying to get us to think about so with that in mind let's look at what the lesson of this text is what is the meaning the second point the lesson of the text well the, the beauty of this parable is Jesus tells us what it's about in verse 9, he gives us the reason for this parable. He says, and I'll read it to you. I tell you, or verily, verily, or truly is the word. Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Sermon over, go home. You're like, what does that mean? That, that makes it even less clear. That's about as clear as mud, right? But that is the lesson of the text. And I'm going to be honest with you. It is an obvious lesson, but it's going to take a while to unpack. So I need your thinking caps on. Let's hit this. Are you ready? Are we together? Are we together. Okay, let's look at this. What is Jesus trying to say? Well, Jesus is trying to talk to us about wealth, the nature of wealth, and how to use wealth. That is what the text is about from start to finish. It's about money. So let's look at this. First point, A. The nature of wealth. I'm going to have to give you a caveat before we dive into this. 
I am no finance guy. In fact, everything I've learned about personal finance is because of my Scottish heritage. I'm a bit of a miser, so I save obsessively. And by making massive mistakes, people saying, why have you done that? That's stupid. You should be doing this. And I'm like, thanks. I could have used that 10 years ago. So every lesson I've learned in my life has been learned by running into poles, you know, like the idiocy of my own mistakes. So don't take my financial advice. I'm going to give you the theology of money, which is what Jesus wants to give us, which I think I'm far more equipped to do. That's my expertise. Finance, don't come to me. Go to someone else. Let's look at the theology of money. Many of us, I would say, in the church, even today, have a very strange relationship with money. To use the well and uh, overused phrase from uh, Chuck Palahniuk's book, uh, Fight Club, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. That's basically our relationship with money. And let's be real, much of our self-worth is wrapped up in what we have or what we can buy, right? If you don't believe me, come to church in dirty clothes and like feel like you're on top of the world. I've done it a couple of times. Actually, when my boy was tiny, I was patting him and he burped and puked all over me. And I came to church exhausted because my kid didn't sleep. And I was preaching that Sunday and I had this nice mark. Um, didn't notice until I ended. Well, the, was I read in my face kind of thing, you know? Anyway, let's look at this. Let's be real. Our self-worth is wrapped up in this. Which is weird. It, it's really weird when you start to think about it. Like, what does having nice stuff impact who you really are? I mean, what, you know, we teach this to kids. Like, this is what we pound in. It's not what you have, but who you are and your character that really matters. Until they turn like 11 and suddenly all their friends and everyone else is like, no, no. It's really what you have. Because that's all we talk about, right? I mean, let's ask the question, does having a nice phone or clothes or a car or having all the toys change you at all? Every single one of you is expecting me to say no. I'm going to disappoint you tonight. It does. It does. It boosts your confidence temporarily. You buy yourself a nice pair of clothes and you, you, you know, you've spent a little bit, little bit more than you should have and you walk into a crowd. You don't feel like, I'm the worst person. Well, you, you perk up, right? If you don't, you're lying to me. I'm sorry. Even me, who has no understanding of fashion at all, like literally I am dressed by my wife and my, my choice of clothes is what is on top of the pile. So this is what I'm wearing because guess what? It was the rightest, most thing in my cupboard. That's my fashion sense. And yet when I get something nice, I feel a little bit better, right? Who hasn't bought something that they've wanted for so long and you just feel a little bit nicer about yourself? Right? And what do we do? We show it off. Why? Because we feel good. So of course it changes you. And it doesn't change you, it changes other people about you. If someone drove into the church in a Bentley, your opinion of them instantly changes, right? For better or worse, depending on which side of the you know, spectrum you lie on. It's just true. If you don't know what a Bentley is, it's a very fancy car. Yeah. The things we own and the things we buy change us psychologically and other people's perspectives of us. Let's be real tonight. But, and here's a big but, those are markers of wealth. They are not really wealth. It's actually nothing in itself but a pointing to. Now what do I mean by that? Well, Someone who is dressed in expensive clothes and has nice cars and goes on nice holidays does not necessarily actually have wealth. They, are, they could be completely faking it. In fact, 
the large majority of the people in the world today currently own very little. And the little that they do own is next to worthless. So many people, and no one ever taught me this, but so many of us buy things with money we don't have that end up worth absolutely nothing. You go to a shop, you buy a nice pair of clothes, you spend way too much money on them. The second you leave that door, they've lost all their value. You buy a cell phone, good luck selling that for the price you paid for it. Even after two years, three years you're done. A car, depends what you buy, but you're not making much money off that unless you're in collectors. And then it's a labor of love and the amount of energy and things that you spend on those cars, you're not really making much money. In other words, all these things that we put so much value that we literally look at people and we're like, oh, nice clothes, they must be, you know, must be doing well, are nothing. They speak of nothing of the real value of wealth. They're symbols. You see, this is the problem, is we have a skewed view of the nature of wealth. We think wealth is status, but status can be faked. Church, true wealth is not status, but capacity. It's capacity to risk and to give. That's what wealth is. This is why in this passage, the steward, knowing that he was about to lose all his possessions, did what? Used his wealth to give generous discounts to everyone. He took massive risk. Why? In order to invest in his future, to gain favor with friends so that he'd have a place to live. Simply put, this is the theology of wealth. Wealth is potential. That's it. And if we see it like that, I think we'd use it a little bit better. We'd stop wasting it. So then the question comes up, if wealth is potential, if it's the capacity to, to give and to risk, how should, we, how should we use it? How should we use our wealth? Well, point B, using our wealth. We often use our wealth to influence how others think of us. Hence, the need for nice clothes and status symbols. And in that, we've twisted the purpose of money, the purpose of wealth, in order to give us what we need, and one of the, the main things that we are using when we're buying these status symbols is what? What do we want to be when we buy these nice things? What do you want someone to say when you show off that new toy that you've got? Ooh, nice. And they're talking about the thing, but we know they're talking about us, right? Like, I, I, you're saying I'm a nice person. Like, nice clothes. Yeah, I know. Thanks, man. Right? That's how we roll. That's, that's what our thoughts are. But the problem is, when we've done that, we've twisted it into something that it's not. It becomes a God to us, and it cannot actually give what we're looking after, what we are seeking for, sorry. Jesus suggests, however, that we should use our worldly wealth to what? Gain others. To rather spend our wealth on others generously so that when it's all gone, we're welcomed. In other words, use your money generously so that you will be truly welcomed, eternally welcomed, Jesus says. In other words, our wealth should have an orientation to others. And that's pretty much what Jesus is telling us to do. To shift your focus. Now you might say, well, shift my focus, I've got needs, you know. I've got expenses and debts to pay, you know, places to go, people to meet. And the, my favorite, charity starts at home, right? However, and here's the big problem with that kind of thinking. When we're spending our money exclusively or primarily on ourselves, we are in great danger of paralyzing ourselves and our thinking into being only about ourselves. And in that church, we become slaves of money. 
Isn't it funny that the more money you have, the more money, the more you worry about that money. The thing I've really like found again, I'm an obsessive saver, so like, like give money and save. save. Oh, this is how I was bred. It's my Scottish genes. Um, but when I had little money, I didn't think about that much. But as my needs have gotten bigger, guess what? It's more, more to think about. More to worry about. Now I've got multiple things and bills to pay. and Make sure you've got enough, do you know? Isn't it weird that the more we have, the more we worry about it. And so how do we break the cycle of this enslavement to money? God wants us to be free. Well, the only way that we could possibly do that is to practice an old virtue called generosity. Generosity. Now, the problem with generosity is generosity is a virtue. And virtues, unfortunately, have to be practiced. So, you can't wake up tomorrow and you can't hear this sermon and say, Barry got it, I'm going to be generous. It's not going to work. Because you might be generous for a day and guess what? Next month's going to happen, your expenses are going to stay exactly the same and so your debts. And you're going to find it that you have to practice it again. And practice it again. And decide every single day to be generous. However, and this is what you'll find, unless you practice generosity, you will never ever be rich enough to be generous. Isn't it funny how we think? Like, you know what? If I get this much more money, then I'll tie to the church. Then I will give. And then what happens? We get a raise and suddenly these like unseen expenses just pop in out of nowhere. And we say, Lord, the next time you give me a raise, Lord, bless me. Bless me, Lord, and I will give, right? I mean, how many times have you heard someone say, Look, I've entered the lottery, but you know what? Lord, Lord, I will give you more than 10%. 11%, Lord. And Lord, think what you can do with 11% of whatever it is, the 52 million rand. I don't know, I don't follow the lottery. Like, he owes us. The irony is, if you got that, you would not give a cent of it away. Because you've never practiced it. You've never practiced it. And if you don't practice this, you'll never learn how to do this. So, to become generous, you have to practice. And you have to practice with what you have. Unfortunately, you, have you ever noticed, uh, I always think about like learning a language, because I've had to do it a couple of times and it frustrates me because I'm useless at languages. I still can't speak Afrikaans and I only lived in this country for 39 years, you know. Is, we don't know, but we practice with what we have, right? Like a kid doesn't wake up and, you know, quote Shakespeare. It's like, out, in, Tummy, my favorite of all of my daughter is your pleasure. When you know you say, yeah, you, you know, she was trying to say my pleasure, your pleasure. It just works so well, you know. Um, we don't get it right. We have to practice with the the limits that we have. That's how practice works. Anyone who's learned a musical instrument doesn't pick up and play Bach. They start with chords and notes, and it hurts and it's frustrating. Guess what? You're going to practice this and it's going to hurt. And it's going to be frustrating. But you have to practice. In fact, why do you think God gives His people the command to tithe? It's not as a law. It's a habit. Something we should be practicing. Start being generous to God's work and not just here but the end of the world. Give. Why? Because if you can't give small here, 
You ain't going to be a nothing in the big things. Again, start with what you have. Give with what you can. But give. Give. Practice. So that you will discover freedom. You see, this is the interesting thing. This is the promise of this verse. Is as we give, we start to see the value of wealth. It's not about us. It's about others. It's not about what we can have. It's about the potential it can achieve. Gary Thomas writes in his his book, I love this book, um, The Glorious Pursuit, and he says, Giving brings meaning to life and sets us free, hear this church, from the tyranny of vanity and egocentric living. Let me read that again. Giving brings meaning to life and sets us free from the tyranny of vanity and egocentric living. The irony is once we start giving with our money, we'll start realizing that we have not just money to give, but talents, time, our attention, our capacities. And as we give, What do we discover? We have more to give. It's a funny thing. It doesn't magically happen. This is not prosperity gospel where if you give, God will bless you. I'm sorry, it just doesn't work that way. What you will discover though is when you start giving, you realize, oh, I actually didn't really need that in the first place. I'm living quite fine with even the 10% gone. Oh, I could have had that, but I didn't really need it. And in fact, probably would have enslaved me anyway. And suddenly you're like, oh, let me try a little more. In other words, church, if you want to be stressed out and enslaved by your wants, depressed because you can't live up to your own standards, then try spending all your money on yourself. Have a blast. In fact, you'll discover, like every single other person who discovers fame and wealth, that even all the wealth and all the fame in the world is not enough. But if you want freedom, and I mean real freedom, start giving. Start small. Give to others and see how little it costs you and see the practice grow. Now, notice, church, that is exactly what the manager does. He gives. He's generous in order to what? Gain acceptance. If you're astute, you might say, but hang on, hang on, hang on, Barry. He was giving away other people's money. Right? Like it wasn't his. He was the manager of someone else's estate. Well, this is our third point. It's not your money either. You see, we struggle with this lesson to be generous because most of us think that what we have is ours, but it's not. It's not. It's God's. And we've simply been put in charge of the little bit that He's given us. To be, in a sense, a manager of His money. Now, I'll be honest with you. Every single time that I've heard this being said, and all the sermons that I listened to in preparation for the service, didn't make me feel better about hearing that. They were like, it's God's money. And I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. I'll try and give more. I felt more guilty every single time I heard that. And so... God willing, I really hope I'm not going to do that to you tonight. I don't want to lay you with a burden that, you know, this is God's money, give. No, that doesn't work. Let me change it. I don't want you to hear this is God's money as a warning. Because it's not. It's an unbelievable grace. I mean, God has given you what you have. And that is by grace alone He has given it to you. Church, be honest with yourself today. If you were to stand before God today and He said, okay, account for every cent that I've given you. Would you be like, Lord, read the books. Or would you feel a little embarrassed? It's like, it's my money. You'd feel pretty bad, right? 
But did you know, have you noticed something? You've had a terrible track record up until today. Has God stopped giving? He hasn't done with me, and I've got a horrific track record. He still gives. It's God's money, and He still gives it. I mean, this is the nature of God. God is a giving God. That's what He does. He loves it. For God so loved the world that He gave, what? His only Son, that whoever believes will not perish but have eternal life. Let's be real. It, it's grace that you have what you want. And you might say, well, I earned it. Or I don't have enough. Let me remind you, church, that if you think you've earned it, you happen to be born at this place, at this time, with these opportunities. You could have been born as a untouchable in the slums of India. And all the hard work in the world will not give you a, a millionth of what you have today. And if you think that I don't have enough, let me remind you that you live in an age of insane abundance. Very few of us in this country have starved to death. Which was a real possibility not even a hundred years ago. Your, flock, your, your, your crops failed and you were starving. Like, like not just like, uh, I'm starving, like you haven't eaten in 12 hours. Or 5 hours or 3 hours or whatever you say. It's my kids, they literally finished breakfast. I'm starving. I'm like, no. <laughs> No. We live in an age of abundance. You, you live in, in I, I, I don't mean it funny, you live in the richest time that the world has ever known times a thousand. I mean, yeah, we, we're messing it up as a world, but God has given you that. And is He giving you that because you've earned it? No. God has blessed you. Even if it is with a little, He gives it. Not because you deserve it, but because He's good. Because He's good. And I say that speaking from someone, the last three years have seen my savings being devastated. Someone who's, you know, just watched my savings just go down for the last three years. And I'll be honest with you, Confession time, church. Because I am a bit of a miser, I get obsessed about this. Lord, what are you doing? You know? Okay, we're going to have to save more and cut back and, you know, become a bit cruel. Because I'm, I'm worried that there won't be enough. And the stupid thing about me is every time I worry, guess what happens? God gives. Does that mean it's not going to be tough to get to the month end? No, it will be. Does that mean it's going to be smooth sailing? No, not necessarily, but God gives. He gives just enough, right? I always say God gives me just enough because He doesn't trust me with more. I would waste it. And I would, if I'm honest with you, I would waste it on myself. I need this sermon more, as much as you do. I need to practice this as much as you do. We need to practice freeing ourselves from the slavery of spending our money exclusively on ourselves. Church, if I know how generous God is, I trust Him. Look at the many blessings He has simply given me. I know I can trust Him. And I can trust Him enough, church, to be generous. I say that because I'm preaching to myself. And I'm going to preach to you. Look at what God has given me. Isn't it beyond belief? Can't you trust Him? In His grace? Do what's the bare minimum, which is be a little generous. 
In fact, Jesus would say in harsher terms, be like your Father in heaven. He gives both to the unrighteous and the righteous alike. So church, what a passage. Man, that's a rough one. I won't lie. But what a lesson. Isn't it beautiful again to just stop and realize God is unbelievably good. Church, would we be with the, sh- the, the smallest shadow of imitators of our good Father? That's what I'm asking. That's what I'm challenging. That's what I'm preaching on myself. Let's pray. Lord, yeah, you you are good. Unbelievably so. Lord, maybe as we meditate upon that tonight, as we meditate again deeply upon your grace, upon our undeserved merit that you've given us because of Jesus Christ and the countless blessings that you pour upon us. But may we learn to, to imitate you, our, our Father. May we be true heirs of you, Lord, our King and God. Lord, may this church learn again, afresh, what it is to be like our God and imitators of Christ. Give us a spirit of generosity, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand as we sing our closing song tonight?